if you take someone that's relentlessly committed to the basics mm -hmm. and is humble enough to have a coach help them see their blind spots, just doing those two things uh, and having obviously a good attitude and a good work ethic, I think you can put yourself in the upper 1% of whatever it is that you're trying to be elite. Do you clearly understand the three most important things that you're working on right now? And more importantly, do you clearly understand the three most important things that your colleague is working on? These are the questions that today's Ask an Expert thinks you should be focused on. Hi, I'm Joshua Carlson, co-founder of Propello Media, and today I sit down with Alan Stein Jr. Today he's going to tell you the importance of mastering the basics as taught to him by Kobe Bryant at 3.30 in the morning in an empty gym. He's also going to talk about the importance of storytelling. He's going to give you the framework that you can use to connect to your audience better. And finally, he's going to give you a life hack. It's a binary question. It's one that you can use professionally and personally to get you closer to perfection. Now let's hear what Alan has to say. All right. So Alan, I want to welcome you to our Ask an Expert podcast. Oh, I'm excited to be here. We're going to have a fun conversation. Awesome. So you have worked with some of the biggest basketball names and um, training them uh, for years, um, but you did a pivot, which is kind of the buzzword of 2020. Um, you've pivoted to actually training organizations and business people. I'd like to just walk me through how that came about um, and, and what that progress was like for you. Absolutely. Well, it, the seed had been planted probably about a decade earlier. Uh, I was working in an event for the NBA called the NBA Players Association Top 100 Camp. Uh, where they brought in the top high school kids from around the country and had them mentored uh, by NBA coaches and NBA players, both uh, current and former. And there was a gentleman that came and spoke to all of the campers. Uh, his name is Walter Bond. Uh, and he's actually, he was a former basketball player, uh, played for a little bit in the NBA and is now a, a very successful corporate speaker. And I remember, you know, this would have been 10, 11 years ago, uh, sitting in the audience and hearing him speak and just being mesmerized uh, by his storytelling. I mean, he had a group of alpha male teenagers yeah. laughing, crying, and thinking. And those are three things that can sometimes be challenging to do with <laughs> teenage boys. And I just remember thinking at that moment, I want to do that one day. Um, I was so into the basketball performance training at the time that I didn't know when that would be. But I knew at some point that that was my calling and something that I, I think I would enjoy doing. Uh, if you fast forward about 10 years uh, is when I decided to make that pivot. Okay. And to be honest, you know, I, I loved serving athletes. I love serving coaches. Um, but I was starting to get burnt out on just the basketball physiology portion. Okay. You know, most of my expertise was in getting players to run faster and jump higher. Right. And that didn't excite me as much as things like leadership, uh, individual performance, creating a winning culture and team cohesion. Uh, so I decided just to make the leap outside of the gym, literally and figuratively, yeah. and take all of those principles and mindsets and disciplines that I had learned from the basketball's best players and coaches and show folks how to apply those uh, to their businesses, both on a small and large scale. So how does one go from, you know, being in the gym, right, to literally suddenly being in the boardroom? Like, what was that actual transition like for you? Well, it was actually kind of an epiphanal moment because uh, I had, I, it was one summer I was in Germany and I was actually speaking at a, a pretty renowned basketball event. And, and one of the cool things about, um, you know, the United States is this is like the basketball Mecca, uh, even though most of the world has become, you know, phenomenal in the game of basketball, anything that comes out of the U.S. is like liquid gold. So they were treating me like a rock star at this event. And, and I remember vividly thinking, I should be much more excited to be here than I am. Like I could start to feel the initial signs of burnout uh, just starting to set in. Right. And I've always believed that, you know, I, I owe it to the players, I owe it to the coaches, but most importantly, I owe it to the game and I owe it to myself to never, to never mail it in, to never yeah. go through the motions. My, my heart and soul needs to be in what I'm doing. And, and I, that was the first red flag that I need to make a change. Uh, coincidentally, or maybe not coincidentally, a month later, uh, a friend of mine who worked for a corporate organization uh, had a speaker bail out on them at the last minute and said, well, you know, Alan's pretty well spoken. He, he's, he's a pretty good leader. Maybe he could come talk to our group. And uh, I got an opportunity to do that. And the moment I stepped off that stage, I said, this is, I, it's time to make the change. You right. know, I, I started putting, 
uh, you know, all of the breadcrumbs I had been dropping from, from hearing Walter Bond talk 10 years previously yeah. and said, now's the time to make the change. And I, I had a few months worth of commitment still on my schedule, which of course I honored and then immediately started making the pivot into what I needed to do to start being able uh, to serve folks in the corporate space primarily as a keynote speaker and workshop host. And, and, and I'll say to, to answer your question, because I know I haven't done that yet, everything in my life always comes back to relationships. Okay. And, and I was always a relationship first type of coach. Uh, so the very first thing I did was lean on my basketball relationships to mm -hmm. see if any of them had relationships in the corporate space that might be able to, yep. to spark some business or get some initial gigs. And and thankfully, uh, my, my basketball following stepped up big time and, and at least got some momentum generated. Yeah. yeah, that was four years ago now. And and I guess, as they say, the rest is history. Okay, well, I love that story. I had a guest on recently and she shared, you know, if she could go back, you know, one of the early lessons that she really took to heart was that she, you know, as far as thinking about what we want to do in life, she, she broke it down differently and she said, think about how you want to spend your day. Um, and so I love that epiphany moment of you walking off the stage and realizing this is it. This is what I enjoy doing. I enjoy this feeling. I enjoy, you know, the impact that I just had. Um, so I, I very much appreciate, you know, you, you having that epiphany moment. And it was, you know, uh, and I had gotten that same feeling for 15 years prior in the basketball space. Right. I mean, when I was in the space, I loved every minute of it. I mean, there, you know, there wasn't anywhere I would have rather have been than in the gym working with players or, or, or helping coaches train their players. So while I was in it, I loved it. But then as I started to see that enthusiasm wane, uh, I knew that it was time to make a change. And uh, thankfully, those things just kind of lined up. And, right. you know, I'm a pretty linear thinker. Uh, I, I'm big on preparation. Um, you know, I, I wouldn't say I have a, a super high tolerance for risk. Um, but I do my homework where I can mitigate most risk. Yeah. I think I can take some very educated risks. So the very first thing I did after making the mental decision and commitment was I reached out to four or five of my friends that were in the corporate space and okay. said, okay, I want you to share with me, what are, you, what are your biggest challenges? Uh, what are your biggest pain points? Uh, knowing my background and where I've been, what types of things do you think I would be able to offer you to be able to help you all? And it was just kind of, kind of a, some initial research because I didn't want to make any assumptions. I didn't want to assume that, that I knew what the corporate world needed because I had never had a corporate job in my entire life. Right. And I've also been around long enough to know unless you are uber famous, which I most certainly am not, you can't just declare that you're a speaker and expect people to start knocking on your door to hire you. Right. Um, you know, if, if I was Magic Johnson or, or somebody like that, then yes, that could work out. Uh, but for me, I knew that I was going to have to prove to others that I had something of value for them and their organization and that I was very aware of their pain points and challenges because that's how I look at, at speaking is I'm there to solve a problem. You know, now my skill sets happen to fall under performance, both individual and organizational, building teams, improving habits, improving mindset. So as long as the problem that they have falls under the umbrella of what, you know, I've learned how to do, then I think there's potential for it to be a good fit. So uh, the first thing I did was do some due diligence on where I thought I could help. And then the next thing I did was, was actually hire a speaking coach uh, and hire some folks to help me on the craft of being a professional speaker. And doing those two things for a combined six months before I even got my first paid gig, uh, I believe helped me at least create the initial foundation sure. where I could then go into this and, and be of value, which has always been the goal. Well, I like the problem first approach, right? I mean, I think a lot of us have skill sets and we have um, wisdom and experience that is applicable across many different industries, genres. But I like that you you said, hey, let's make this applicable to the specific audience by targeting what the problem is. Um, and I love that you hired a coach, right? I think that this is a um, an undervalued thing, especially in the business space. Um, you know, you work with some of the biggest athletes in the world. You know, Kevin Durant is, you know, arguably the best scorer in the league. Um, and I'll, granted, he's coming back from injury right now, but but he has a coach, right? Yeah. He has a trainer. And I think that that's missed in business. Um, so I'm glad to hear that you took that approach. Speaking of great athletes, speaking of great players, what are some of the common threads that you see across them that you think help make them who they are? Well, well, 
the first is you just said it so insightfully. These guys have coaches, you know, and I say plural because a guy like Kevin Durant has multiple coaches in his life. Uh, they might go by a slightly different name, but, you know, he has someone to coach him on his nutrition. He has someone to coach him in his business and his investments. He has someone to coach him, obviously, in the game of basketball and specific skill sets. He has someone to coach him on his body and his physical fitness and his strength. I mean, uh, all of these guys have coaches, which means they have to be coachable. And right. being coachable uh, mm -hmm. means having confidence in yourself that you know that you have the potential to be elite, but blending that with enough humility and vulnerability to acknowledge you don't have all of the answers. Uh, you still can get better no matter how good you are. I promise you, uh, Kevin Durant believes in his heart. He is the best scorer in the NBA, but he doesn't think for one second that he's already reached his max of what he's capable of doing. So he needs someone that he trusts that can help him see his blind spots, uh, help him add, you know, uh, different areas to his game. So these guys are incredibly coachable. Now, when you get to such an elite level, the, the actual percentage of people uh, that, that have the acumen to be able to coach you is pretty small. You know, Stephen Curry is not going to take shooting instruction from any guy that walks off the street. There's probably only a handful of people in the world that have the type of acumen that could help him get even better at something he already does at an expert level. So they have very high discernment with who they let coach them, but they're always coachable. Uh, a couple others. One is uh, they also, they never get bored with the basics. Uh, elite performers have a very uh, strong appreciation and respect for the fundamentals. Sure. Uh, in the game of basketball, it's pretty obvious. Your, your footwork, your shooting mechanics, your ability to handle the ball, those are the fundamentals of the game. Uh, but, but in business, and this is one of the first exercises I have folks do, is really sit down and figure out what are your top three or four fundamentals that if you work towards mastery of those during the unseen hours, and, and you can get a real firm grasp on those fundamentals, then your business will, will you know, uh, go to new heights and take off. Uh, most people already know a lot of what they need to know to be successful. They just don't happen to be doing it. And a lot of that comes in the shape of skipping over the fundamentals. Uh, and, and while the, uh, the list could certainly extend out, if you take someone that's relentlessly committed to the basics, and is humble enough to have a coach help them see their blind spots, just doing those two things uh, and having obviously a good attitude and a good work ethic, I think you can put yourself in the upper 1% of whatever it is that you're trying to be elite. Well, you said something that I want to I want to take a little bit further, which is the unseen hours, because I think a lot of um, I think a lot of the general public see these you know elite superstars and they just think, oh my God, these these players are just incredibly talented. But I don't think that they really appreciate the grind that goes into these unseen hours before they actually show up on your television. Um, so let's talk about the the unseen hours and what you see um, can can help businesses and help people apply those and, and become better and become you know masters of their craft. Absolutely. Well, the the folks that say what you just said are partially right because talent is a factor and talent. You know, there's a component of talent to be successful in anything. Uh, in the game of basketball, a good portion of that uh, is in physical talent. Yeah. Is, is, you know, do you have the strength and the speed and the athleticism uh, and the skill level to be able to play a game like basketball? Uh, one of the reasons I love business so much is you can take the physical component out of it. I mean, certainly in order to run a thriving business, you have to be high energy. Like yeah, there, there are certain physical components that will certainly help you. Um, but your size, your strength, your stamina, your, your athleticism doesn't matter in business. Uh, now, other forms of talent, you know, uh, emotional intelligence. Uh, I think to some degree, some folks are born with a little more than others. But emotional intelligence is a skill that can be improved. Um, some folks are born with more charisma than others. And I would think that having more charisma, if combined with the fundamentals, would make you a better sales professional, but yeah. the actual fundamentals can be improved. So even if you're not the most charismatic person in the room, you can absolutely improve your ability to sell and to connect with others just by working on those things. So one of the reasons I love business is I do think talent is less important to your eventual success, even though some of those things may give you a little bit of a head start. Um, but, but that and that in and of itself uh, is I, I think what, what makes it it's so fun. Like it's, it's much more of a level playing ground uh, in basketball in, in order to be elite. So 
Um, the, the talent is definitely a portion of it, but then it is getting crystal clear on what you need to do to be successful. And then as you said perfectly, dedicating yourself during the unseen hours uh, right. to get better at those specific skill sets. And a large portion of success in business is what you do during those unseen hours. Right. You know, I mentioned sales earlier. You know, if anyone listening to this uh, is in sales, which I say with uh, kind of a wink because everybody is in sales yeah. of some right. sort. I mean, yeah. if you're the CEO, you are selling your philosophy, you're selling your, your culture. Um, you know, no matter what business you're in, you're selling something. But if someone is a, a specific sales professional or a sales rep, you know, a good portion of, of your success in sales is done before you make that call, is right. done before you have that Zoom meeting or, or sit down with a prospect. You know, and you have to ask yourself, what are all of the things you did before you actually called them or met with them to increase your chance of creating the connection and figuring out if they are the right fit for you and if you're the right fit for them. So, um, and, and, and you hit it perfectly. You know, now that the NBA is back on TV after a, a long delay, you know, when, when a player like LeBron scores 40 one night, I think you're right. I think a lot of people look at that and go, you know, well, he's just talented or he got lucky and they don't have an appreciation for how many hours a guy like that puts in behind the scenes for every minute that he's going to be on the court, uh, you know, when the lights are on and the cheerleaders start dancing. And, and it's really the connection between preparation and performance. And elite, elite achievers know that, that if they want to perform at a high level when the stakes are high, then they have to be relentlessly committed to their, uh, to their preparation in advance. Yeah, I think most of us are lucky in some capacity, and obviously a LeBron James is a physical specimen. Um, so his luck is, you know, bigger than, than somebody else's, but, but we all have luck. I think it's the elite people that leverage and don't settle on that luck and just take it further. Um, so earlier this year, and what, you know, clearly was a precursor to just how difficult 2020 was going to be, um, we lost a great human being which is Kobe Bryant. Um, it's somebody that you actually had a, had a chance to spend some quality time with. Um, what were some takeaways that you, you took from him um, during those times? Well, the one that absolutely changed my life was the, the concept that I mentioned of never getting bored with the basics. I mean, that was what he said to me verbatim uh, mm -hmm. after I watched one of his early morning workouts and, and, and was just shocked at, at the simplicity of what he was doing. Right. And, and people often get that word, uh, they think simple and easy and basic and easy mean the same thing, and they don't. Um, I mean, he has an unparalleled work ethic, and, and he had unparalleled precision and focus with what he was doing, but the stuff he was doing in that early morning workout uh, was, was very basic. I mean, these, these were literally drills that I had done with middle school age players, uh, right. but he understands that being elite is having a masterful control over those basics. It's not being able to do something sexy and shiny by skipping the basics. Now, he also understands that if you, if you have firm control over the basics and fundamentals, that you will build from that and you'll graduate. And eventually, you will be doing more advanced moves and right. techniques in the case of, uh, case of basketball, but you don't skip steps to get there. And, and that was the biggest lesson that he taught me. Uh, plus, the unconscious lesson of here's a guy in the offseason uh, during the summer who had already won an NBA championship, already a multi-time all-star and all-NBA player, already, you know, uh, confirmed his, his, you know, ability to go into the Hall of Fame, uh, you know, was one of the, the players on the Mount Rushmore of current players, had made hundreds of millions of dollars, and he was still up at three in the morning uh, preparing for a workout in the off-season. So right. the unconscious message that that sent me is, hey, no matter how good I am, I can still get better. And I'm not going get, to get, get complacent on what I did yesterday. Right. Every day I have to wake up and reprove myself. So, you know, uh, just those two intera interactions alone just had a profound impact uh, on me. And uh, ever since then, I've really tried to commit myself to focusing on the basics and the fundamentals in everything that I do. And right. because I'm human and I'm fallible, just like everybody listening to this, every once in a while when, when I'm kind of off course or, or things are a little fuzzy, uh, when I recalibrate, I usually realize that I have been skipping over the basics, that I've been trying to, to skip a, a rung on the right. ladder, right. and you just can't do that. If you want to climb any ladder, you have to touch every single rung. 
Well, so what I love about this story is that to me, you know, so I'm a big basketball fan um, and I was not given the, uh, the lucky genetic, you know, kind of athleticism, right? But um, I think a lot of us romanticize, um, you know, oh my God, I'd love to be an NBA player. Um, but the takeaway I have here is that, you know, Kobe's in the gym at 4 a.m., 3.30, 3, whenever, right? It's, it, he's in there, he's grinding and the work. Um, and what I think is lost is that Kobe loved his his passion, he had this passion for, for this game, um, which was his job, right? I mean, that was, that was what he fulfilled him. And I think, you know, if we are not willing to be in the metaphorical gym, whatever that is for whatever profession we're in, then maybe we're not in the right profession, right? I mean, if oh, we're not absolutely. inspired, then we're not doing because, you know, we, we can romanticize all we want, but everybody has a job and it's, how committed are you to it that maybe determines whether or not you're in the right spot? For sure. And there's actually two things that we need to do our best to fall in love with. Uh, one of them is the actual job or the career or the vocation at hand. Um, right. I, I think Steve Jobs was the one that said something to the effect of, you know, if you're not super passionate about what you're doing, you won't be able to put in the work required to be good at it. Like yeah. no one can put in the hours required when you loathe what you're doing. So first and foremost, you got to find what you love, but you also have to love improvement. Uh, you have to love development and growth. You have to love and appreciate the process uh, because with any job, I mean, uh, as, as being a professional speaker, I love what I do, uh, but it's not puppy dogs and ice cream every moment of every day. Right. I mean, there are portions of things that I might not love, but I love the end result that those things get me. And I love the feeling of improvement uh, of moving forward, and I do love the process. I love being able to say, okay, this is my goal. This is the desired outcome. What is now the strategy and process and blueprint that I need to put together that I can work on daily that will inch me closer to that thing? So uh, even for a basketball player, I mean, you might, you might not love doing basic footwork drills, but you probably love winning. You probably love, you know, uh, getting the accolades and the paychecks that Kobe got. So even if you don't love the specific part of your job at that moment, if you can learn to love and respect the process and growth in general, then those things become more palatable. And, and I think if you can fall in love with all of that stuff, then the sky's the limit. And for me, that's, that's the code at which I live by. Uh, the only tweak that I made was as I started to fall out of love with the basketball performance, I recalibrated and found something that I loved even more, and yeah. that's what I'm doing now. And, and that's one of the pieces of advice that I usually give young people, but is applicable to everyone. And that is find the thing that you're really passionate about, find something that you're really good at, and then find where those two things intersect. Yeah. And that point of intersection is your strength zone. And the more time you can spend in your strength zone, uh, the more successful you'll be for sure but the more happy, uh, the happier and more fulfilled you'll be as well. And right. as we get older, we develop new passions and we uncover new talents and skills. So that, that point of intersection uh, will certainly move over time. Yeah, it's fluid, right? I mean, yes. Yeah. Um, okay, so let's talk about storytelling because I think storytelling is one of the best ways to resonate a message, an idea. Um, and I think as business people, I think we miss this, right? We get in love with, it's almost like being a parent. You know, you love your kid, right? Um, but the reality is, you know, my neighbor doesn't love my kid, right? And so, you know, if I'm talking to somebody, you know, that storytelling is a great vehicle to get them to love my kid. What is your process? You know, you are a speaker, so this is, this is a huge part of your day-to-day. Your -day. What's the process to developing a good story? Like, how does that, how does that come, come to you? Well, I'm going I'm to take it one step back, and then I'm going to answer that, because I, I love where you're going with this. You know, <clears throat> as a speaker, my job is not to give people new tools. My job is to give people tools that they'll use and actually put into action. Right. Because if they don't change anything after I speak with them, then nothing in their life is going to change. And, and for the most part, my, my presentation was worthless. If it doesn't get them to actually change behavior. So when people call me a motivational speaker, I know what they mean by that, but that's not really what I consider myself. I mean, I consider myself much more of a coach and a tactician because I want to give people practical and actionable strategies that they can actually implement. And the key for them being able to implement stuff is to make it sticky, is to make sure they don't forget it and they understand the lesson and the why behind it. And as you teed up so perfectly, 
Storytelling is the best way to do that. Storytelling is the most effective way to teach lessons and yeah. to make things really sticky. And, and this isn't something that's new age. People have been sitting around the campfire telling stories, you know, yeah. for hundreds and hundreds of years, if not thousands. So storytelling for anyone that is trying to teach or instruct or coach uh, or empower or lead a business needs to get good at storytelling. And, and to be honest, uh, I think the best marketing campaigns uh, for the best brands in the world ultimately tell a story and right. they paint the picture in a way that makes it really resonate with you, the customer or client. So storytelling is really important. Uh, the vast majority of my stories are all first person stories of things that I experienced, uh, but many of them are the experiences I've had with basketball's elite. And, and I do that for a couple of reasons, um, and, and none of which is to try to pump my own ego or to make myself feel better. Uh, I know, and I, I know this as a father, I have three young kids, and I know it having been around young players all the time, you know, if I tell you that mastering the basics is important, it's a coin flip on whether or not you care. If right. I tell you that Kobe Bryant said that mastering the basics is important, you're going to sit up a little taller in your chair and you're going to lean in because now I've, I've connected that story to someone with just unparalleled credibility uh, right. in, in that specific life lesson. So um, that's my goal is, is to be able to uh, certainly make stories uh, entertaining because I want folks to enjoy the experience, uh, right. but also make sure that there's kind of an educational and an engaging component as well. And what, one of the, the, the things that was bittersweet about, about Kobe's passing was I received so many emails and text messages and, and shout outs on social of people that said, Alan, you spoke to our organization six months ago. I'll never forget the Kobe Bryant story you told me. I've been focusing on the basic sense. I'm so sorry for your loss. Yeah. And it, it warmed my heart to know that my telling of that story about him certainly was, was paying honor to his legacy, sure. but it, that it made it sticky enough that people never forget that, that they, they reached out and that in some way, shape or form, that one story did cause them to, to create some new habits and behaviors and, and got them to recalibrate and they started to make some progress. So yeah, storytelling is, is an essential skill for everybody, not just for professional speakers. Yeah. So question about, you know, when you're first doing this, how, how did you, you know, I, I have to assume that story one versus story today um, are, are probably pretty different, right? So how did you individually grow? How did you validate, you know, oh, you know, I, I think about like, I listen to a Joe Rogan, he's a comedian, right? That's, that's oh, yeah. his craft. Um, and he talks about, you know, they go and work it. You know, they, they grind it, they go out and test it. So how did you go out and test kind of the, the storytelling to, to massage it into, okay, now I feel like I've really got something good here. You know, I, I love that you went in this direction and brought that up because uh, I'm a big believer that in order to get good at any craft, you can't just stay within the, the narrow confines of your craft. You have to step outside and learn from others. And, and two other uh, uh, spoken word art forms that I study religiously uh, are hip hop and stand up comedy. I think both hip hop and stand up comedy are just brilliant when it comes to being professional orators. And wow. yes, the concept of a comic saying, I'm going to scribble down on a legal pad something that I think could be funny. Yeah. And then later I'm going to try to really turn that into what I would call a joke and a setup and a punchline. Yeah. But then I need to go test that out. And, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to go to the local comedy club, you know, a couple nights a week and do five minutes of material just to see what works. Uh, Louis C.K. once said that, you know, if, if the audience doesn't laugh, then it's not funny. He said right. the audience is 100% the jury of whether or not something's funny. So oh. he has to try it out on them to yeah. see if it works. So uh, when I, I said earlier that I spent that first six months doing my due diligence and getting a coach, one of the other things I did was just a massive daily brain dump of looking back and thinking, what is every single story and experience that I've ever had in my life that I believe could be of value to someone else? And that's the big piece is, sure. this isn't just a story about something funny that happened to me in third grade, unless there is a lesson to be learned from it. So, so I would come up with this list, and yeah, one of the lists was, hey, think of every you know, elite basketball player and coach you've come in contact with, and what did they teach you? Is there a story there? Then some first person stuff about my life experiences. And I started to whittle it down till I had what I thought was around a dozen stories 
that I believed had potential to be pretty good. And my first year of speaking, uh, which was 2017, I basically took the mindset that I will speak anywhere at any time for anyone at any fee because I need to get reps and I need to actually practice this material. Yeah. And I did just that. And in my first year, I probably did 60 different events. The vast majority of them were unpaid, but I got to try those stories out. Yeah, right. I got to see, you know, uh, wh what did folks think was funny? What did folks think, you know, really made them, um, you know, internally reflect and dig deep? You know, what order of these stories? What's the real lesson? I mean, some of the stories that I tell today are the same stories I told, you know, four years ago, but the lesson is completely different. Because as I sat with it more, I thought, you know what, what I thought was the most important lessons, actually not. There's something deeper here and started to work those. Now, one of the biggest differences when I first started, my, my keynote, if you will, was just this random collage of stories. Uh, each and of itself, I think, was a decent story, but there was no structure. There was no flow. It was just kind of like, hey, I need to vomit out these 12 stories and I hope you learn something. Right. Now I've got some precise structure behind it. Okay. You know, I, I open my talks with the Kobe Bryant story because uh, never getting bored with the basics is my found foundational theme. Okay. And I close my keynotes with a Stephen Curry story because of the lesson that is. And then depending on who my audience is and what my goal is, I've got all of these different stories that I can kind of plug and play uh, based on what would be most helpful for the audience. Uh, but as you said, they take time. You have to work them out. Um, yeah. And yeah, with anything, you get better through repetition. The more I've told those stories, the better I've gotten. Uh, when I'm on stage or even on a Zoom call, I always give myself permission to, to ad lib a little bit, to try something new in the moment. And there have been times where I'm telling a story that I've told a hundred times, but something in the moment makes me feel compelled to throw in an additional line or wow. try something different with my body. And if the feedback is very positive, if they laugh or they, they immediately lean down to write that down, when I go back later and watch it on video, which I always do, then I make a note and say, hey, I need to add this line in permanently because yeah. it worked so well. Right. And, and that's really how I approach it. You know, I, I, would, I would certainly first and foremost, when, when someone hears me speak, the biggest compliment I think I can get is, man, that guy really understands us. You know, he did his homework. Uh, yeah. This was not a canned talk. He knew what we needed to hear and he did a great job with that. But the second thing is I'm going to use the stuff that he shared because man, those stories really compel me to put these things into action. And anytime I can get either one or both of those compliments, it really warms my heart and makes me feel like I, I did a pretty good job, at least in that person's eyes. Yeah. Well, no, I, you know what I, big takeaway I'm getting from you is that I love that you, you know, people are like, Oh, he's a motivational speaker. And you're like, well, whoa, whoa, whoa. Like, sure. I want to motivate, but I want to actually give you practical. Um, yeah. because I think that that's where the value Because so many times, I mean, growing up, I can't tell you how many events, you know, I've, I've been to, but I've seen more people go to more events and it's like two days later, it's like, Hey, how was that event? What are you applying? Right. And, and yeah. sometimes people have it, but a lot of times they don't. And so I love that. Hey, here's a practical way that you have it. Um, another thing that I want to touch on, because I think that this is valuable. Um, you, you talked about the Kobe Bryant and the, you know, Hey, focus on the basics, right? You know that because you taught that to, you know, middle school kids, right? Because it, it is, it's incredibly important. But what I love about this is that you appreciated, Hey, Bob, Susie, Jill, Tom, they may not take it to heart if it's coming from Alan, but if it's coming from Kobe, suddenly it has more value. And I think that this is missing when we do think about our business and we think about our services. We're like, hey, here's why it's great. No, don't, don't you be the order of it. You, right. you should just reshare how a customer said it, that it's great. Because now that it's coming from a customer, okay, now it carries more bait. But a lot of businesses miss that point. Absolutely. Well, it, everything I do is in service of the audience. You know, that was a coaching mantra I learned. Coaching 101, teaching 101, parenting 101, speaking 101 is the mindset that it's not about me, yeah. it's about you. 
I mean, the entire reason I'm doing this with you right now is to serve you and is to serve your audience. This is not about me. Now, my goal is to offer what I believe will be most valuable to you and to your audience. And, and you're doing such a masterful job with leading the dance, but that's what's most important. So I always have to ask myself, you know, am I telling this Kobe story so that they think I'm cool and I'm doing this to make myself look good? Or am I telling it because it's actually going to increase the stickiness for them? And I have to run everything through that filter. And as long as everything I'm doing is in service of the audience, then I think it's the, it's the right move. And that's, that's the way to go. And, and, and speaking of that, kind of piggybacking on what we were saying before, to me, the, the, the most important part to me is when I'm speaking, someone feels con compelled to write some stuff down and take some notes. If I give a 60 minute keynote and somebody didn't write anything down, I really feel like I missed the mark for that person. Yeah. And the reason I say that is I have heard some of the world's best motivational speakers. I mean, these guys will get you so jacked up to run through a wall and I'll sit and listen to them for an hour and I won't write down a single thing because they didn't say anything that I haven't seen on a, on a Nike t-shirt or I haven't seen on a Facebook meme. You know, right. they're saying some great stuff, but it's, it's not anything that I need to write down. And to me uh, as a speaker, I'm offended if I don't say something that someone feels compelled to write down. Now, with that said, uh, I also realize uh, I'm not inventing any of this stuff. You know, I tell my audiences in the beginning, I've got a disclaimer to make. I'm not going to tell you anything today that you haven't heard before or that you don't already know uh, intuitively, intellectually. However, I caution you not to sit back with your arms crossed saying, I already know this. But what I want you to do is ask yourself one of the most important questions you can ask yourself, how well am I doing this? Yeah. And that's the gap that everybody has. It's the gap between knowing and doing. And I realize that, that I may say something in a slightly different way, uh, use different terminology. I may package it slightly different in a way that really resonates with that person. I'm not the first person that says you need to focus on the fundamentals. <laughs> I'm not the first person that's, you know, like I get that. But can I say it in a way and provide some, some actionable strategies that gets people to do that stuff? Because that's ultimately my goal is when someone leaves my talk, I want them to have hyper awareness on the things that they already knew, but more importantly, a plan to start putting those things into action. Because knowing without doing is completely useless. So I want folks to start doing the things that they already know they're supposed to do. And, and many of them come up after and are like, man, I needed this. This was the kick in the pants I needed. Uh, I already know that I should have been focused on this, this, and this, and I haven't been, but now I've got some tools to do so, and I'm excited to make some progress. Well, so knowing and doing, I love that, right? Um, and I want to take this, I want to continue this theme, which is something you said before, which is repetition is kind of like the, the mother of all teachers kind of thing. Um, let's talk about repetition and the value of it, because, because really, right, that kickstart is needed for a lot of us, but it doesn't actually become permanent until we've done it over and over and over, and people miss um, or maybe just devalue the importance of repetition. Oh, yeah, there's no substitute for it. I mean, repetition is the oldest and most effective form of learning on the planet. And that's, that's not going to change. Right. Uh, so repetition, and, and one of the things we have to tell folks all the time, repetition is not punishment. I mean, they, many people think that repetition is punishment. No, repetition is the key to mastery. And when you can have you know, uh, great clarity on the very small handful of fundamentals that you need to master, and then you work on getting as many purposeful and intentional and quality reps as you can in that small handful, that is how you become elite. You right. don't become elite by just randomly throwing stuff up against the wall and trying to be good at 10,000 different things and staying on something just long enough until a new trend starts and then you start doing that thing. That's, you know, and that's what's tricky because that's what social media wants you to think. Yeah. Uh, that's what, unfortunately, some businesses want you to think so that you'll buy their product. But bottom line, you have to figure out what is it that I want to be really good at or what is it that I want my business to accomplish and then what are the handful of fundamentals that if I master these things, it will greatly increase the chance of getting the desired outcome or having this business thrive the way that I know it's capable of. And then just you got to pour, you know, game type repetitions into those, those fundamentals. So what about repetition as a pertains? I guess, how do we leverage repetition um, to maybe give us a, 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 
a preview that, hey, this is, I'm going in the wrong direction, right? I, I'm, I'm being repetitive with something, but you know, I, I'm not, this isn't for me kind of thing. Um, how, do we, how do we identify that early so that we're not going down too far a path that we, we don't belong? Well, we need to, this goes back to being coachable. And I love that we're circling back to how we started. Uh, we need to have some type of feedback loop and feedback system where we can make sure uh, that we're doing uh, repetitions properly and sure. that we're, we're doing them in the right way and that we're going in the right direction. You know, it's that climbing the corporate ladder will make sure that it's leaning up against the right wall. You know, you could be practicing the wrong thing over and over and over. And, you know, my, my friend Drew Hanlon, who's a, an expert MBA skills coach says a bad rep takes away more than a good rep adds which yeah. means you have to be really careful you know when when players say hey i'm in the gym working on my shot for two hours if they're in the gym working on poor shooting mechanics yeah. what they're doing is getting really good at being a bad shooter yeah. and we don't want that so right. they need to have somebody uh, and in many cases especially in a sport like basketball where film can be one of your best friends you need to make sure that you are working on the right things in the right way yeah. at the right time so that it's moving you closer to where it is that you want to be because nothing could be worse than getting in uh, the wrong repetitions doing things incorrectly uh, because then you'll 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 actually be working in the other direction and in order to do that many times we have those blind spots this is why we need a competent coach or, or if it's in your business, uh, some type of accountability partner or somebody that can say, hey, I'm going to keep an eye on you as you work towards mastering these three fundamentals. Yep. Because if you can master these, not only does that help you grow, that helps all of us. Because yeah. remember, when you decide to be a part of something bigger than yourself and be a part of a team, you're, you need everyone on the team to have your same commitment to growth. You know, that was one of the reasons a guy like Kobe or MJ would find themselves frustrated a lot because very rarely would they come across anyone that cared as much as they did yeah. about perfection and improvement and those types of things. And he's sitting there thinking, well, if everyone would be in the gym at three in the morning doing what I'm doing, we'd never lose. But you guys don't seem to have the same commitment and passion that I do. And he'd often find himself frustrated. So yeah, we have to make sure that we're working on the right reps in the right way at the right time. And that's where we need either an accountability partner, um, you know, or, or a coach of some sort. Okay. Well, I love that. And I think that, you know, I think it's often missed and maybe it's, maybe it's not as easy, right? Maybe we don't have as many resources as, you know, the regular business person, right? You know, you talked about Kevin Durant and he's got a nutrition coach. He has a business coach. He also has an unlimited supply of kind of, you know, monetary resources. So it's not easy for us, but I think the, the fundamental and value here is that you need to be coachable, right? It starts first there because I think that we can actually be coached by a lot of people in our everyday lives if we yes. just listened and were receptive to it. Absolutely. Well, let, let's, this is, this is at least in the same realm of what we're talking about. Let's just assume that you and I, uh, we work together. I'm the CEO and, and you report directly to me. Well, the very first exercise that we need to do, and anyone listening in business, I highly recommend you do this, is uh, first and foremost, I'm going to have you write down what you believe your three most important uh, priorities are or responsibilities, and I'm talking just work right now. I mean, yeah. I, I would assume that possibly your faith or your family are your most important yeah. priorities, but just work work-wise, what are the three things that you need to focus on to maximize your role in this company so that we can all be successful? And I want you to write those three things down. Then as the person that you report to, I'm gonna write down the three things that I think you are supposed to be responsible for and focused on. Yeah. And just for starters, let's see if you and I generate the same list of three. Uh, yeah. More times than not, we won't. Yeah, we might have overlap on one or two things, but you actually think you're supposed to be doing this, and I actually think you're supposed to be doing that. So immediately we've got some dysfunction. So right. we need to get some clarity on that. Then once we get some clarity and we both agree that these are your big three, then I, as, as in this case, the leader or someone that's supposed to be coaching you, need to say, what is it that you need from me to help you grow in these areas? What resources do you need what, that I can provide? And, and this goes back to, yes, uh, as a company, we may not have unlimited resources to pour into you, but I need to make sure that you know that I'm trusting that you're going to work on those big three things. Those are your focal points, but that I'm here to help you with those three. And that I want to make sure that you know that I'm happy to give you feedback on the reps that you do for those big three. 
Because the number one goal now is that we've established that in your role, which is what the team needs your role to be, might not be what you want it to be, but it's what we need it to be, you are going to be relentlessly focused on those three things. And, and since you report to me and I'm supposed to be coaching and leading you, I will do anything in my power from, from providing resources to offering real-time feedback to help you get elite in those three things. And as a leader, that's not extra work. That yeah. is my work. That yeah. is my job is to make right. sure that you have all of the tools necessary to fulfill your role to the best of your ability. And if I can also do that to, to another teammate of yours and another teammate of yours, uh, right. and then you're doing that with maybe three or four people that report to you, now we've got a culture of performance improvement. Now we've got a culture of feedback. Now we've got a culture of, of clarity, and this, this is what we want. Um, so when we're willing, and, but this takes you being coachable. This Correct. takes you being able to say, you know what, Alan, yes, um, of these three things, uh, one of them I really need some help on. You know, I'm, I'm really, I, anything you can do to provide some feedback or resources, I could, you know, I would really appreciate it. Now we're, we're all working towards that collective goal. And all of this falls under the umbrella of the process. You know, I mean, whatever it is that our business is selling, whether it's a, a you know, a service or a product, it's all going to come back to you just stay in your lane and focus on your three things and your teammate will be doing the same. And if I, as the, as the leader, have the right people on the bus and they're sitting in the right seat and everyone is focused on their three things, which obviously won't all be the same, then we're all going to be swimming in the same direction and we'll get towards that that desired outcome with as minimal friction as possible. And, you know, and, and everything that I just said to you right now is basic. I noticed your head didn't explode. It's basic. <laughs> Nothing about what I just said is easy. It's not easy to do all of that stuff. Right. If it was easy, every business in the world would be doing it. But I can promise you right now, there are people listening that haven't even taken the step of getting clarity on what each team member is supposed to be doing. Yeah. I mean, there's some businesses that go years without recalibrating that and it causes dysfunction and frustration. You know, why is Josh always doing, he, he keeps focusing on this. He should be focusing on this. And then you're thinking, why isn't Alan ever praising me for the job I'm doing over here? Right. You don't even know that I think you're supposed to be doing something else. I mean, this stuff is, is so basic, but none of it's easy. But if we go back to the fundamentals and we actually put these systems in place and people actually do that exercise with the people that report to them, you'll see performance skyrocket. Yeah, I think, I mean, it's communication, right? It's yes. really just, and what I love about it though, is it's stripping it down to its basic format, which is, you know, it is a three bullet list, right? It's not like, tell me a story. And again, stories are important, but it, it's a three bullet list. And I think that that's an incredibly valuable takeaway because, um, because you're right. I think a lot of us end up in roles. Um, it's maybe different. It's morphed over time. And nobody actually sat down to communicate collectively to say, oh, oh my God, I've been rowing you know, towards the left this whole time. I didn't realize we pivoted to the right because we just didn't talk about it, right? I mean, it's, and it's, it's, it's basic. It's basic. And we, and we end up making assumptions, which is always, yeah. that, that can be a killer of communication. And then, you know, one of the hardest parts is, you know, when we, when you and I started this company 10 years ago and we only had six of us, it was much easier to do that. Now we've grown and we have 600 of us and it's really hard. You know, when you grow really fast and you scale, those are the little things that make it more challenging. But then just to weave storytelling back in, uh, let's just say again, trying to keep things as simple as possible of the three things you're supposed to be focused on, you're really struggling with number two. Well, if I can come up with a story that yeah. the lesson of that is exactly what you need to improve in number two, now we've got something. And I can explain to you either, you know, in my case, a, a player that I worked with, or as you said, anytime you can use a previous, a previous client or customer as an example or a testimonial or even firsthand experience. Sure. Like, yeah, Josh, I, I remember uh, I used to have difficulty doing that. Here's something that I tried that really worked well for me. Maybe it'll work well for you. Or maybe you're being frustrated because you've been doing this. Trust me, man, I have so much empathy for you because I used to do it that way too. And I got equally frustrated. But then I decided to try it this way. And, and now I'm using storytelling to help teach the lesson of what it is that you need to make an improvement on the fundamental that the rest of us are counting on you to do. That again is the most important part. Right. In order for this team to be successful, you personally have to know your role, 
embrace your role and do everything in your power to star in your role to the best of your ability. And right. the rest of us need to do the exact same thing with our role. And then one level up is each and every one of us need to appreciate, respect, and value your role in what you're doing. And it doesn't matter where you fall on the org chart. I'm the CEO, I'm at the top. It doesn't matter if you're at the proverbial bottom. If you are on this org chart and you are on this team, you are an important puzzle piece to what we're doing. And everyone on this team needs to value, respect, and appreciate you. Uh, even to the degree of you know, a building service worker, many of them come in overnight while we're all at home and clean so that we can show up the next day and have a safe, clean environment uh, that allows us to perform at our best. Yep. How many people do you think actually take the time to thank the overnight building service staff or to leave them a note and, and you know, whatever you think is appropriate, leave them a six pack of beer and just say, Hey, enjoy your night. Thank you so much for the sacrifice you make to make sure that we can have a safe and clean environment to perform whatever it is that we do. Um, that stuff is vital. And when everyone on the team can buy into their own personal role to that level and appreciate everyone else's, now you've got something really, really special. And of course, by sheer numbers, that's much easier to do with six people than it is with 600 or 6,000, but the recipe doesn't change. Yes. We have to make sure that these things get implemented uh, regardless of size. So I'm gonna make a recommendation to anyone watching right now, which is, hey, as we're looking at these three bullet points of what I should be doing, that that's one of the bullet points. Right. Because I think that to your point, as far as six people, 600 people, if you can actually make that a part of everyone's role, then I think you scale. Right. That 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 eliminates this, you know, oh, my God, we've scaled so big and we've lost. No, because that's one of the things that we never let go of is yes. appreciating, you know, one another's role within the organization. Absolutely. And, and this is where, I mean, if, if you were, let's just say now your brother comes in and he's higher number 601, he's going to be the 601st person on our org chart. And, and someone needs to be able to, once we've already vetted that he is the right fit for our culture, that he has the same core values that align with our core values. So sure. we know that he's the right fit is being able to say, you know, welcome so-and-so, we're so glad you're a part of our company now. Right. Here are the three things that we need you to focus on. And if you focus on these three things and you star on these three things to the best of your ability, and you care about your teammates and you pour into them in the same way that they're gonna pour into you, we're gonna create something really special here. And we're so thankful to have you part of our team because there is no one else that I'd rather be doing those three things than you. We are so fortunate to have you, and I want you to know that myself and everyone else on this team will anything we can to empower you and to help you do those three things. So if you need anything from, from some feedback to a resource, do not hesitate to reach out. Now, again, if I'm the CEO of 601 people, there might be a chain of command where I say, hey, you're gonna be reporting to your brother, Josh, but if you need any feedback or you need any resource, you don't hesitate to go to him because his number one job is to give you what you need so that you can do your three things to the best of your ability. And let's get clarity right from the beginning. Yeah. And then let's make sure instead of doing this annual review, waiting an entire year to check in, you should be checking in with him weekly or monthly and just saying, hey, what's, you know, uh, hey, so-and-so, what's on your mind? How are things going? Anything I can help with? Uh, is there anything you need from me? You know, how have you been, you know, doing on these things? Is there anything you've been finding challenging? And you're checking in with him all of the time, then there's this constant recalibration and we'll never veer very far off course. Right. If he starts to veer off course, you'll catch it within a week Correct. and we'll, we'll get him back on, you know, on par for what we need. Well, this is a perfect place to wrap. Um, I've got more questions, but I know that you, uh, you got a hard stop. So I, Alan, I want to thank you for coming on. Um, not only motivational, but also practical um, things that we can apply. Um, so I really appreciate uh, you as a guest and, uh, and what you shared today. My pleasure. Do I have time to share one last thing that I of think course. will put a bow yes. tie on all of it? Yes, please so do. from a practical standpoint, and this is something you can use personally or professionally. This is something you could use individually or organizationally. Uh, I'm gonna use it personally and individually for me, but folks hopefully can extrapolate how you could apply this to any outcome you want. So I'm 44 years old. I've got this vision of the man I want to be 20 years from now. So who do I want the 64-year-old Alan to be? Well, without going into too much detail, I want the 64-year-old Alan to be physically, mentally, and emotionally fit. Uh, I want the 64-year-old Alan to be someone that has very deep 
in fulfilling relationships with his children, with his family, his friends, and his closest colleagues and clients. I want the 64-year-old Alan to be doing what he considers meaningful work that is in service of other people. So that's kind of loosely who I want to become. And now every single decision I make in my life, I run through a binary filter of, is doing this thing gonna take me closer to being that guy or is it going to take me further away? You know, from what I eat for lunch to, to who I follow on Instagram, is that going to increase my chance of being that guy or decrease it? Yeah. And obviously, my goal every day of my life is to do as many things as possible that increase the chance that that's who I'll become. And, and I don't worry about perfection. I'm definitely not batting a thousand. Uh, I'm more interested in progress. But if I can inch by inch and decision by decision, make most decisions in alignment with that, then assuming I live to see 64, which in and of itself I know is not guaranteed, uh, then that is who I will become because that is what I'm designing by intention. And we could do that with any, anything. Even if you have a sales quota at the end of a quarter, is how I'm spending this hour going to take me closer to reaching that sales quarter? Or quota, excuse me, or is it going to take me further away? Right. And if we can run everything through that very basic binary filter, it really simplifies things. And, you know, I use that strategy for everything in my life and decide what it is that I want, get crystal clear on that, and then make sure that my behavior and my daily habits are in alignment with that. And it doesn't guarantee success, but it greatly increases the chance of it happening, which is the game that all of us are playing. What can we do to increase the chance that we will be happy, fulfilled, uh, feel, you know, feel significant, feel like we're contributing, and the proverbial success that everybody tends to be chasing? Well, I love it because I've heard that from a management standpoint, which basically, hey, is this good for the customer? Is it good for the company? Am I willing to be accountable kind of thing, right? So it's a very simple, you know, way to evaluate something. But I love this because it's, it's binary. It's even more simple. You know, is this getting me closer to where I want to go, where I, to who I want to become? Um, and certainly, uh, there preceded before you added this extra, but uh, today is, is definitely getting me closer to where I want to go. Um, so I appreciate you, you sharing that because it's, it's a really meaningful way to, to look at life. Well, my pleasure. And I lied. I've got one more little thing. The, uh, the acronym WIN, W-I-N, is something else that all of us should keep at the forefront of our mind. And W-I-N stands for what's important now. Mm -hmm. And if you can always refocus your lens on the most important thing at that moment so that you're fully present, now you'll be inching closer to your goals. I mean, uh, right now, the most important thing for me is certainly having an engaging conversation with you, but it's to add value to anyone that's going to invest their time into watching or listening to this. Uh, I want them to feel like this hour that you and I spent together was a great investment of their time. That's all that I'm focused on right now. The moment you and I hang up from this, I will then switch to the next thing on my agenda and that will get my full attention because at that moment, that's what's most important. And I'll continue that all the way up till I pick my kids up later today. And then being present with them will be the most important thing in my life at that moment. And I will give them the attention that they deserve. So at any moment during the day, just recalibrate and ask yourself, am I focused on what's truly most important right now? And that combined with that binary filter, if you can just do that for most of the time, don't even worry about perfection you'll be good to go. And, and this is the last pin that I'll put in this. Every night before you go to sleep, ask yourself this question. Say, I just traded 24 hours of my life for the progress that I made today. Yep. Am I happy with that trade? Right. And if you can put your head on your pillow at night and say, I'm happy with the trade I made today, then you know you're, you're doing things right. And every once in a while, you'll have a stumble and you'll say, no, today was not the best use of my time. I did not make the most progress. That's okay. Tomorrow is a new day and just pick right back up. But that's one of the most powerful things you can ask yourself before you go to bed. Well, you said it earlier, but it's not perfection, it's progress, right? Yes. And so as long as you're progressing in the right direction. So, uh, well, here's to everybody winning um, and, and using that acronym because I think it's a, it's a good tool, a um, good mnemonic device. Um, and it's one that, you know, can have a meaningful impact on your life. So thank you very much. My pleasure. This was a lot of fun. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Alan.